Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So we got Bitcoin up here on the daily. Bitcoin right now trading at $16,700 per coin. Uh, you guys can see right here on the charts, we have seen a little bit of movement for Bitcoin. We have seen a bit of an uptick, a bit of higher volume here on the charts. I also noticed something very interesting on the XRP chart, guys. Take a look at this. This is XRP on the hourly and you guys can see we've seen an uptick for xrp as well but not before we saw this now what is this you may ask an opportunity to load up on cheap xrp a liquidity grab from wales as you guys can see here on the charts uh we did actually see a pop in xrp price and the price level has gone actually above where it was before this buying event so we're going to get into this we're going to talk about this we're looking at some sustained momentum upward, at least on the one hour charts. So we're going to talk about that, guys. John Deaton here revealing the results of his latest poll. OK, over 18,000 votes here uh, in 2023. The SEC versus Ripple case will settle or go to verdict. Well, 59.2 percent of you guys think that the case is actually going to settle and 40.8 uh, percent thinks it will go to verdict. Now, uh, John Deaton was a little surprised about this. He doesn't actually think the case will settle because of the Hinman emails. So a bit of a shift here, although the XRP community seems to believe that the US SEC's lawsuit against Ripple does not go to verdict, American lawyer John Deaton, the owner of the Deaton Law Firm, now thinks that we will get a decision by Judge Torres. So uh, this article just kind of, uh, you know, goes through the history and some varying different opinions from uh, Brad Garlinghouse and Stuart Alderati, Ripple's in-house counsel. Down here, though, they discussed the John Deaton poll. As you can see, 59.2% of those who took part in this poll said that they expect the two sides to reach a settlement. Uh, but John Deaton came out and commented on this. It was my opinion, he says that if the emails were extremely valuable to Ripple and extremely damaging to the SEC, the SEC would settle before turning over the emails, drafts, and comments, but that did not happen. Instead, Ripple uh, has now cited that, uh, that the Hinman emails in its opposition brief, uh, although the SEC asked the judge to seal the documents, if the judge considers the Hinman speech emails in her decision in any regard, the emails and documents become judicial documents and the judge will order the documents to be filed on the public docket with a few redactions. Although the emails and comments will likely show some uh, underhanded crap by the SEC, I don't believe they are as damaging as people, including me, once believed. So John Deaton, you know, changing his tune a little bit on this. If they were... I believe the case would have settled by now and the emails wouldn't have been turned over to Ripple. Yes, I am aware of the tweets from Brad Garlinghouse and Stuart Alderati stating the emails were worth the wait and uh, and ex uh, and, ex sorry, and expense as the SEC's conduct was shocking. Even if the emails prove former SEC officials acted improperly, reckless or with bad motive, it doesn't change the analysis. In some, I believe the SEC has accepted that the emails will eventually become public. In fact, in Brad Garlinghouse's tweet, he said, when the truth is eventually known, we will be shocked. It is my opinion now that the Ripple case will not settle because of the Hinman emails. So John Deaton here, you know, thinking now that it will in fact go to trial or at least go to verdict. And he's stating this for all the reasons above. I mean, um, you know, we, we were assuming that the Hinman emails would be, you know, a, a huge revelation, but he's saying, no, you know what? If they were, if they were as bad as we all thought they were, then the SEC should have settled by now. And that's an astute observation from John Deaton. So 59.2% of us think it's going to settle. John Deaton, though, going against the grain, he thinks it's going to go to verdict. Of course, this will likely have an effect on how people perceive crypto. David Schwartz has even come out and said he believes that the sluggish performance of XRP and other major cryptocurrencies is a result of uncertainty as to whether crypto is actually going to be the next big thing or not. And I think that this SEC lawsuit is going to help catapult that along. He gives the example of Google here. He says Google in 2000 as an example. Uh, Schwartz compares how people may have been skeptical then about how the search engine was going to deliver billions of dollars worth of new wealth but some became true believers and made millions. He believes that crypto is in a similar situation of now. As a result, prices often move together as investor sentiment waxes and wanes depending on whether more people become convinced of crypto's future potential or not. Simply put, the markets are still trying to figure out if crypto is going to be the next big thing. So those are David Schwartz's words. Uh, you know, we all can see the light beyond the tunnel or what happened or the light through the forest. I think that's the saying. We can see the light through the forest. You know, when you research this day in and day out and, uh, you know, you watch videos, you read articles, 
you kind of get it. You kind of see where cryptocurrency is going. But, you know, there, there are a lot of traders out there that are purely trading crypto as a speculative investment uh, based on emotion. And so, you know, this is why we see these predictable cycles. I mean, you and I, we can benefit from this because we know the real world underlying utility and the value that crypto has. So, you know, we can predict what's going to happen in a cycle and make money off that. But we're also holding for the long term. And, um, you know, we're just not there yet. This is kind of like late 90s Internet stocks. Uh, is where we're kind of at with crypto. I think that's where David Schwartz is going with this. Uh, at the same time, Schwartz has stressed that this is just his personal opinion and not to follow him for financial advice. Obviously, uh, I missed this part. Therefore, he says, mass adoption of different crypto technologies could succeed if the industry is able to convince people about crypto's potential by offering real-world use cases and a sufficient level of of scalability. And I think that, uh, you know, once we see a conclusion in the SEC case, well, XRP will definitely begin melting faces. So it's a timing thing. It's a legislation thing. I think the cryptocurrency will soon catch up uh, to its potential. I mean, it kind of has to, right? In the United States, I just happened to see this from XRP Crypto Wolf brought to me by Dawdler for XRP. Gold back crypto coins have now been issued in Russia. So we've been hearing of central banks buying lots and lots of gold. Well, now Spurbank, okay, one of Russia's biggest banks, they are issuing gold on the blockchain. So to me, this is a, a move to, uh, you know, debase the US dollar, especially if now you can use gold as a currency, you can spend it fractionally. Well, this means that you no longer have to really rely on fiat currencies. So the largest bank in Russia, Spurbank, uh, just announced that it has just issued gold back digital assets on its own blockchain. This is an interesting concept because there's been a lot of debate on whether crypto is considered a security or a commodity in the U.S. And now that there is a new existence of crypto coins that are backed by a store of value commodity like gold, this may change up the financial landscape in Russia. So like I said, you know, um, being able to uh, use gold as a method of payment, fractionally use, you know, an ounce of gold. If you have an ounce of gold, what's that worth? 16, 17, 1800 bucks. I don't know. What is the price of gold right now? Uh, gold to USD. We're looking at about $1,800 per ounce right now. And so Spurbank is the one responsible for this. What they've done is that they've essentially created a new digital form of gold that now exists on the blockchain that users can have self-custody of. Uh, it is expected that this will attract a lot of new investors and institutions, especially as there is a lot of concern about inflation for fiat currencies. So completely debasing the US dollar, completely, uh, you know, even just debasing the idea of using fiat currencies as a mode of payment too. So I wonder if this is going to actually um, affect the Russian ruble and if this would in fact put negative pressure on that in uh, Russia and uh, if Russians even care about that, if the government even cares, because this is bigger than, uh, you know, using the Russian fiat currency, the ruble in Russia. The transformation of how, uh, you know, different citizens around the world are going to be paying for things is uh, going to be revolutionary. It really is. And so, you know, it has been that US dollar standard for a long time. But uh, now that there are other means, other methods to be able to transact, like, for example, DLT technology that does run on RippleNet. Transferring anything of value becomes a lot easier. And so uh, it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. So uh, interesting news there. Wanted to thank XRP Crypto Wolf and Dawdler for XRP for pointing me in that direction, guys. I also saw this from 801 underscore XRP. More news surrounding the liquidity crisis, the silent killer liquidity crisis that will stalk the global financial system in 2023. I've talked about this uh, quite a bit on uh, in several videos that I've done over the last uh, week or two, let's say. So I'm not going to go into uh, detail on this, but I did just want to bring this up again. Another uh, example of uh, where we're at financially. So, you know, just uh, to just go back to that idea of Russia uh, tokenizing gold on the blockchain, things like this are going to help uh, people. So in that particular case, going to help Russian citizens specifically who, uh, who use Spurbank, I'm guessing. And so how do we combat this in the West? And are our banks going to be doing the same kind of thing? Down here in this article, uh, it says, to quote a recent International Monetary Fund blog down here, it says, measures of market liquidity have worsened across asset classes, especially in recent weeks, as heightened uncertainty about the economic outlook and monetary policy left investors with much less risk appetite. This, it said, may pose risks to financial stability. So, like I said in that example, Russia preparing for this, tokenizing gold as uh, just one method to combat this. The IMF has also said key gauges of systematic risk, such as dollar funding costs and counterparty credit spreads have risen. There is a risk of uh, disorderly tightening in financial conditions, 
that may interact with pre-existing vulnerabilities. This is about the closest institutional economists come to warning people to watch out. Uh, so this is an interesting article. I will link it in the description of the video for you guys to uh, to read. I do suggest you do read it. A lot of great information here uh, kind of breaks it down for those of you guys who uh, might not understand how severe a liquidity crisis is and how it can just kind of sneak up on you. So uh, thought that was an interesting article, but crypto is here to combat that. And so, you know, we've got projects like the Flare Network specifically that will be up and running shortly, guys. We will be getting our Flare tokens very, very soon. I believe it is, uh, when is it? January the 9th, uh, coming up in a few days now. British Miss here on Twitter put up a poll. If you sell your initial 15% of Flare, you lose the remaining 85%. So it's looking as though the Flare Networks is uh, trying a, a new method here uh, in order for you to uh, to incentivize you to keep your initial flare tokens. And uh, she, she puts the caveat in here if it is voted through. So what are you going to do? Now, if we just take a look at the price, this is the IOU price of the FLR token right now as per BitTrue. You guys can see it is trading at around uh, 46 and a half cents. And uh, that has actually gone down quite a bit from the height of the bull market back in 2021 when XRP uh, saw its most recent high. FLR IOUs were going for about $2.25, so $2.25. So, I mean, I can see why uh, people may want to, uh, you know, sell their FLR tokens as soon as they receive it. And so the Flare Network, they're putting in this mechanism to prevent you or at least to dissuade you from selling your flare tokens. Now, I mean, the, the whole purpose of airdropping these tokens is to, uh, you know, incentivize you to want to participate in the network. Nothing is decided yet. The vote has not happened yet as per British Miss, but if passed, you won't get your 85% if you sell your 15%. Well, David Schwartz also chimed in on this. You want to sell before everyone else does. When you build in events that people want to wait for to sell, it creates the reverse incentive to sell before that event. He goes on to say, if you wait until you get your 85%, you lose your chance to sell before everyone else is waiting uh, to get the 85% sells. That's a lot of downward price pressure that would become built in, and thus a lot of incentive to sell before that pressure materializes, creating artificial incentives to make people hold an asset that they don't want to hold for fundamental reasons is really bad. So David Schwartz is saying that this, uh, this um, mechanism to get people to prevent people from selling is not actually going to work. He goes on to say, I say this from over a decade of painful experience with attempts at lockups and other incentives to hold. They backfire always. They don't help in the long term because they expire. And they don't help in the short term because everyone knows they're going to expire and tries to beat everyone else trying to beat the expiration. They discourage a long-term holding uh, because you know the releases are coming. But as I discovered last time I tried to explain this, nobody seemed to want to hear the truth about this and wants to believe that somehow incentivizing people to hold an asset they don't actually want will magically make it more valuable. So David Schwartz, uh, fairly pessimistic about this idea. Uh, nevertheless, it has not been voted on. I will leave the uh, the poll in the description of the video if you guys care to vote on this. An interesting concept, I mean, you know, if, if people can get 46 cents for something that they didn't even buy, I can see why people dump it right away. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting concept concept, right? We are only getting 15% of our FLR tokens for those who did participate in the snapshot. So I guess the question is, is it worth to sell 15% at 46 cents or whatever it is, uh, and then wait for the 85% in hopes that that will be worth more or not? I mean, the price could go down significantly. It could go down to one penny and the 85% at one penny may even be worth less than the 15% at 46 cents. I don't know, that is math that uh, has not been sorted out yet, but uh, that is one possibility here. So just wondering how this is going to go down. I guess the bigger point is, you know, Flare getting very, very close to launching. Part of an ecosystem that, uh, you know, as David Short said, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning here, cryptos need to be able to prove themselves to be the next big thing. And that's, uh, you know, what's really going to drive value uh, to cryptocurrency prices. We're already seeing it in Russia. I mean, you know, some countries are already realizing, hey, look, let's leverage this technology. We're, uh, you know, going to be coming into a tough 2023 financially uh, with a potential liquidity crisis. Well, I think it's pretty certain we're going to see a liquidity crisis. But, you know, some thinking uh, liquidity crisis is looming, bad financial technicals coming in 2023. So how are we going to alleviate this? Well, obviously, guys, cryptocurrency adoption and uh, projects like the Flare Network. Now, we did just see that one minute candlestick for XRP that I showed you guys at the top of the video. Why did XRP just have a negative 10% candle in one minute? Let's go back to the XRP chart and let's talk a little bit about this. 
as you guys can see here, this is the hourly chart for XRP. Let me throw it on one minute. And uh, this actually sh uh, demonstrates this quite, quite nicely here. On the one minute chart, guys, you guys can see this. One minute, we saw XRP dip down. Whoops, dip down all the way down here to about 30 cents per XRP and then rebound like a slingshot all the way back up. Now, the more interesting point that I wanted to mention here is that this zone was where XRP was trading before and now we are actually above this level. So could this have been a positive selling event to hopefully get us to higher highs? And I mean, what is it really? What is it? What happened here? This article, guys, from Michael Branch. Okay, XRP price suddenly plummeted by about 12%. The XRP price had a harsh downward move in the early morning hours of the Asian market. Okay, so this would have been 9 a.m. Tokyo time. Uh, within 45 minutes, the price dropped from 33.9 to 29.98, meaning that XRP experienced a drop of about 12%. Uh, remarkably, this move did not happen in line with broader market sentiment. Okay, so that's one thing, uh, you know, taking a look at the rest of the market, we have not seen other coins uh, behaving the same way. It's also worth noting that the sudden price drop seemingly happened without any real news related to Ripple, such as uh, any development in the legal battle with the SEC or the XRP token. So this article suggesting that the price move seems mostly influenced by speculation. Well, others are saying something differently. Well, others are suggesting differently. Okay, this from Alex Cobb here on Twitter. XRP liquidity grab complete, commence the pump. So two things here. First, let's talk a little bit about the liquidity grab and what that even means. That's uh, exactly what I thought happened here as soon as I saw this. A liquidity grab, stop losses being hunted down, and experienced traders buying up large quantities of XRP at that 30 cent price range. Let's not forget exactly where the bounce stopped here, exactly at 30 cents. So that to me smells like a liquidity grab. Uh, another article here from Michael Branch, right down here, a seasoned uh, crypto analyst highlighted the shocking move, uh, claiming it could be a liquidity grab. Some individuals attributed the drop to the XRP tokens recently unlocked from the escrow account. So let's also not forget uh, January 1st was just yesterday and Ripple did just uh, release more XRP from escrow. In two transactions yesterday, Ripple unlocked 900 million XRP tokens from the escrow accounts. Uh, its current value is 34.28 or 0.3428. As of press time, XRP has scaled through the pivot point at uh, 33.78 and conquered the first crucial resistance setting at 34.04. So a few things here, guys, to make note of. Liquidity grab, uh, could it have to do with the escrow? Chances are the escrow had nothing to do with it. But what we are noticing, investors, big investors are buying up, they're finding opportunities to buy up XRP in a large liquidity pocket, namely where people have put their stop losses. And that looks like it's happening at 30 cents. Now, is this momentum going to continue? Because if we take a look at uh, the chart here, we are now above this level here where we originally saw XRP trading before that dump. And the volume is looking fairly sustained right now. Um, as of the time of this recording, we're seeing it uh, bounce off this new level of uh, micro support down here at about 34.1. So boom, boom. Uh, wondering if we can get above these levels up here at about 34.6, 34.7 or so. You can see it a little better, I think, on the uh, on the one hour here. Turn that off auto and let me zoom in a little bit and remove some of that. So a lot of volume during that period of time. Uh, you guys can see a very long tail here on the candlestick. And this again is the daily. Actually, hang on. Maybe we'll put it on the four hour uh, to give you guys a sense. So even just within the last few hours here, boom, a lot of selling pressure, followed by two fairly large green candlesticks. And uh, now we're in that next four hour period. So we got to still see where that leads us. Now, in terms of a liquidity grab, can we glean anything from it? One of the first advantages of getting started with Forex trading is the liquidity that markets offer. So this also relates to the crypto market too. This liquidity offers ease of trading, making the market popular among traders. Uh, small and big players tend to acquire larger positions in the market than they can afford in an attempt to benefit from the leverage. This is where the concept of a liquidity grab comes into play. Uh, let's start by understanding what a liquidity grab is, liquidity zones in the Forex market, and the liquidity grab strategy. 
So basically, big traders, institutional investors want to fill their bags, want to, uh, you know, fill big orders. They must find liquidity because, you know, if there's no liquidity in the market, how are they going to do it? And so they look for stop losses. They look for where, uh, you know, other traders, retail traders are putting their stop losses. And uh, as per the chart there, it looks as though that was at 30 cents. Stops are often considered to be critical for survival in a leveraged market. A trader who does not include stops in the strategy could uh, face forced liquidation. And so a majority of market participants are considered to be speculators who don't enjoy the luxury of holding onto a losing trade for too long as their positions are leveraged. Big and small traders often use stop losses. So again, uh, more stop loss talk here. Uh, and stop loss hunting is a common practice for these, uh, for these types of traders. When too many stop losses are triggered at the same time though, a high volatility scenario is created where some investors can find unique opportunities. Such a practice is called a liquidity grab, which we discuss further in this guide. So just down here, if such a trader enters the market at a low liquidity area, the volatility it creates impacts the average price negatively. Lower liquidity generally results in a more volatile market, bringing drastic changes in the prices. On the other hand, if a trader enters the trade in an area of high liquidity, it results in a less volatile market where prices don't change so drastically, ensuring a better average price for the position. Uh, these are all zones where stop, lo uh, stop loss orders are placed. The concept of a liquidity grab comes for the need for big players to enter the market guys in a liquidity zone as they look to take large positions. So what can we glean from this then? This is in fact a liquidity zone. Again, let's throw it on the one minute and large institutional traders is what we're assuming here. Wanted to buy up cheap XRP at 30 cents in order to fill their bags. And so that is exactly what happened. Is the momentum going to continue? Well, I mean, we have to see high volatility for that to happen. So far, so good. So far, so good. Let's keep our fingers crossed and hope it is sustained. That's just my opinion, but I wanna hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.